where we work with these guys, and like I, I go up to like Bob and Daniel's desk, and Dennis's desk, and Diana, and like talk to them like they're totally normal people <laughs> about like problems or some sentence you ended with a preposition awkwardly the last week or something someone took out of a story this one time and then you're just like oh but you were doing real journalism weren't you <laughs> sorry but they never make you feel that way instead they're like super friendly and they're like oh yeah that sentence with the preposition that was that's a tough loss there. <laughs> so, um, like I said at the beginning of the evening, I wanted to be um, the opposite kind of journalist of all these people. I started reading fashion magazines when I was like 14 or 15. Specifically, when I was 15, my family went on vacation uh, to southern Indiana to go camping. If that tells you how far I've fallen from the tree. <laughs> Very far, actually. Um, my mom's a park ranger, my twin is a park ranger, and my little sister is a park ranger. <laughs> they are cool. Carolyn's in Zion this summer. You should go see her. She's charming. She's very pretty. We prefer her. I think she's the best finnerty. She's a park ranger at Zion this summer. But so anyway, I went on these park. I went on a lot of these camping trips, but I read Elle and other fashion magazines pretty consistently <laughs> on the whole trip. Like I would do the hiking and I would tip over the canoe, which is a true story. Um, but like mostly, I I just was sort of like, this won't be my future probably, except for when I begged my bosses to let me go to the Grand Canyon, and now I write about that stuff a lot, and I'm, I feel like I'm really doing my parents justice. But I wanted to become a fashion reporter, and that's like not a real job for people who don't go to Ivy League schools and aren't rich and thin. <laughs> it's just the truth. And I didn't know that at the time. Instead, I just thought it was like a job a person could get, right? Like you're a teacher, or a nurse, or a fashion journalist. But I didn't know that. And you know what? When you don't know things, you don't know you can't have them. Which is why people approach each other in bars. And it's why I called, it's why I called uh, this woman at Harper's Bazaar for like months and months and months when I was a junior. And I just called her, and I called her, and I called her, and I called her, and I wore her down. And I got an internship at Harper's Bazaar where I did not fit in. <laughs> Because I was not thin, and I did not go to an Ivy League school, and when I made a joke about needing a haircut for less than $100, people did not laugh. <laughs> this is a really true story. I remember getting off on the elevator on my first day, and there was a girl who I knew was in high school, and I was like, <laughs> And she had started her internship early, because her house was being photographed for L Decor, and she just couldn't be around for it. I was like, what? I also knew that her jeans were $700 because they were made by Chloe and I had seen them in fashion magazines. And I was like wearing this skirt from Banana Republic that was like bone colored white leather. And it was on sale at the outlet mall near my parents' house and I, it was still so expensive for me to buy it. And I should have known right then that this was going to be a long summer. But what I did learn is that I did still want to write about fashion. I just probably wasn't going to do it in New York. And then this like amazing magical pony named Sue Clark Johnson, who died earlier this year, but decided that she wanted to save newspapers by putting out a fashion section for girls. She launched this thing called Yes. And I was an intern because Nicole hired me. And I had had this like fashion experience. And I was like, oh god, pick me. I'm already here and I like clothes. <laughs> And they were mostly like, well, she's cheap and she's here. How bad can it be? I'm kidding, that's not how journalism happens. <laughs> um, but I was super, super excited about the job. And I felt like I could put to use like all of these years of like excruciating focus on fashion and cosmetics. And I want you to keep it to yourself if I don't look like the kind of person that you think has been focusing on fashion and cosmetics since she was 12, because you were wrong. I used to get fashion magazines and I would put on all this makeup before I would go to bed at night and I would like experiment with face, with like makeup. And then I would like wash it off because I was like in high school and my parents didn't think it was appropriate to wear, you know, false eyelashes to school. Or, you know, like sculpting contouring. That wasn't like a thing. Like the Kardashians were not a thing. In fact, what was a thing was like grunge rock. Like there was like no female archetype that I was even aspiring to be like. I just was like reading fashion magazines in Northwest Indiana and thinking, I'm gonna try that. <laughs> I mean, my mother is a park 
Park Ranger, you guys. I was alone. Um, but it was fine. But this is true. Like in college, I um, I remember once like going to out and I would like wear false eyelashes and like really glossy red lips, which are like the I mean they are like the Olympics of fashion. Like gloss gets everywhere, and bright red is a mess. And this was like, I was like barely 21, also a heavy drinking year, so you shouldn't wear makeup like that. It's gonna be a mess. And where was I going? Nowhere! Like to class, where everyone else was just in like heavy sweaters from Abercrombie and Fitch. And jeans. You guys didn't laugh as hard as that as you should have, but you should have seen this. It was terrible. It was just like a fashion Chernobyl. And I, I just like, I just, struggled, right? So when I came to Phoenix, I thought this was like an answer to all my prayers, and I was going to take some fashion risks, and I was going to style some fashion styles, and I was going to write some fashion stories. And one day, seriously? <laughs> They were very tall. They were four and a half inch high heels, but they had a wedge underneath them, so like it wasn't as tall. Um, it was less high than the heels I'm wearing tonight, because obviously I was going to work in these, right? And they were from TJ Maxx, because I could never afford Donna Karen platform wedges, right, in like normal land. And my mother had taught me that like you really, it seems insane to spend more than $40 on a pair of shoes. God rest her. No, she's not dead, but seriously, no. Um, so, I bought these shoes and I wore them and I bought them for my fancy job at the fancy big city paper because I thought that the fancy journalism fashion women there would surely appreciate Donna Karen red lipstick platform wedges. And then I paired them with a pair of Abercrombie and Fitch uh, blue and white striped knee socks because that was like a thing that was happening. Like knee socks and heels were like a thing that was happening. Don't judge me yet. <laughs> it gets worse. And then I paired it because it's like Phoenix and it's like a billion degrees. I paired it with like a denim mini skirt, but like not super mini, not like inappropriately short. And I have amazing legs. So like a medium mini skirt. And I was also 23, right? And then like a white tank top, because it's like a thousand degrees. And I didn't wear cardigans in the office at that point. So that's what I wore to work. And I had to like go out and interview somebody about something at like Fashion Square. And I'm not gonna say it was a fashion emergency. There was just something I probably needed to go talk to somebody about, and that was my job. It was like go out and interview people about fashion things. And I went to my boss Laura, and Laura says, Okay, you can go tomorrow. <laughs> It's not that anyone's editor ever says you can go tomorrow, right? Like, you're like, chop chop, quick like a bunny, go, go, go. And I was like, no, no, I'm good. Like, my day is pretty loose today. Like, I have things planned for tomorrow, but like, I can go. And Laura's like, no, but really, like, go tomorrow. Like, find something, like, you have things you should be doing at your desk today. And I was like, insistent. I mean, I was like, no, but for real, like, I want to just get out there and do it. Like, it's fine. And like, I do see now that, like, I backed her into this. And then she said what you know she's going to say, and she was like, you can't go out dressed like that. <laughs> I 
video of this. I am now the age that she was. <laughs> oh. that I did not go out dressed like that. And you know what, I probably, well, I wouldn't have said it because I have a different ending to this story, but I understand what she meant. And she meant, you look stupid and you can't go represent the newspaper dressed like a trollop. Like, that's just not how we do things. <laughs> but she would never say that I was dressed like a trollop because she's super classy and because we have an HR department. Yeah. <laughs> so she may have said that about me behind my back, but she certainly did not say that to my face. She just was like, and then she said, tomorrow when you are dressed like you are ready to interview strangers about their sense of fashion, you will go out and you will talk to them. And I just like, I don't know, went back to my desk, probably like mollified, mortified, and then like totally annoyed that she was being so lame. And like, you know, went on with my life and went on with my job. And I'd like to tell you that that was like when things really turned around for me in the fashion department, without me a lie. Um, and Jeez, Dad. It's you. <laughs> I'd also like to tell you that this is a setup that they waited for me, and that they would never do that for these other super important journalism stories. That's not true. I'll just feel bad about this tomorrow. <laughs> you guys, that was really great. Um, so, the real thing, though, is that, like, the older I got, I, I just. Like, I never learned, and I'm not gonna bore you with like a laundry list of like my greatest fashion moments slash missteps. I will tell you though that a few years ago, last year, we were gonna do a storytelling night about risk, and I kind of was like, I don't feel like I take a lot of risks in my life, because like I'm a very uptight, like guilt-ridden, Catholic, neurotic person, and I think about things a lot, except for what I'm gonna say, but normally I think about things a lot, and like I didn't, I, I asked my friends, like I sent it out to my friends, and I was like, what do I risk? Like, what are my risks? And these started, they all piled up. They were like, oh God, do you remember the time we came to her house and I asked her if she was doing laundry? <laughs> and then she wore that out. That's a true story. <laughs> but you know, the older I got, the more I realized like there is, there are better choices I could be making. And then when I got on TV with Channel 12, I spent two and a half years on TV and I had a professional like stylist. And when I got on TV, sometimes I would wear things and they would call me back at my desk and they would say things like, that's a weekend jacket. <laughs> Which is a very diplomatic way of saying that made you look fat and or busy on TV and you should never wear that again. But even then, it didn't like fundamentally change the way I dressed, it just changed the way I dressed to be on TV. And when I stopped being on TV, I went right back to my normal way of dressing. Because also what happened at the same time was like we started being on Twitter all the time and we started being on Facebook all the time and like Snapchat and Instagram and I put out a personal newsletter every week which is pretty great if you want to sign up for it, no big deal, you can give me your card later. <laughs> and like I started hosting storytelling nights and you're on TV all the time and now I'm on NPR in the mornings and like you start to have this moment where I made a choice a couple of years ago and I was like there's a Megan that's sort of like what I'm like to talk to in real life and that's like a sort of a specific person and then there's like a Megan and that's like the public Megan. And I realized like the public Megan is the Megan. There's just totally not like, there, yes, there's a personal Megan, right? If you date me, that's like a one thing. But like, <laughs> mostly there's not this huge, huge difference. But when you read my Twitter feed or you go to my Facebook or you read my journalism, it's not a ton like talking to me, right? It's like talking to me, but it's not the same. And that's because I'm held accountable so differently. Because if I misspeak or I am misunderstood, if you think I say something racist or stupid or deeply misunderstanding of the broader context of an issue and that offends you, then you can hold me accountable. Like in the court of forever, which is the internet. <laughs> and like, there's no real response for me. It's my bad, like I misspoke, you're right, you misunderstood or I did it wrong. And I don't ever forget that. Like it literally keeps me up at night. And that's a good thing, like that's fine. That is the bargain into which I have entered for access to your time and your hours and your reading and your trust, all of that. But it also means that like when I pick out my outfits, I'm sort of like, hmm? What's the worst thing they're gonna say about me? <laughs> she looks stupid today? Fine, I could, but that's different from being stupid. 
She looked kind of skanky. You don't know I'm not. <laughs> Come talk to me. Like, right? Um, sh she looked inappropriately dressed for the occasion. That might hurt, but might also be true. But you know, the next day I'll just put on something else. And then I'll just look like something else, and I might look very professional, or I might look very demure, or I like, might look polished. And of course, at which point I would like you all to call my mother and tell her how nice I looked. <laughs> but more to the point, like it won't matter, right? Because like this sort of feels sometimes like the one space I have left for like absolute authenticity that's not just hanging out quietly with my friends in a space in which no one has cell phones and no one is tweeting this. Yeah. And that's okay. But it does mean that if you don't like my outfit today, or you don't like it tomorrow, that's okay too. <laughs> <laughs>